If a patient has a foreign body aspiration, you don't want to only consider choking and coughing as possible presentations. If the patient has cyanosis, if the history mentions a sudden onset respiratory distress or even altered mental status, think about foreign body aspiration. In these patients, you'll hear focal monophonic wheezing on the affected side. So it's typically unilateral. There will be diminished aeration of the affected side, inspiratory strider, and even wheezing. Radiographic findings include hyperinflation or atelectasis on the affected side. You can even visualize the foreign body sometimes. Most aspirated foreign bodies end up in the right main stem bronchus. Exudative pleural effusion. This can be due to conditions such as a chylothorax, malignancy, empyema, or tuberculosis. A chylothorax is an exudative pleural effusion due to a disruption of lymphatic flow within the thoracic duct. A chylothorax is differentiated from other causes of exudative pleural effusion by its milky white color and elevated triglyceride levels. So a pleural effusion is basically excessive fluid in the pleural space. Once you see a pleural effusion, your next step is to think about, hey, is it transudative or an exudative pleural effusion? You can use the light criteria to distinguish between them. But for a transudative effusion, it's typically due to conditions such as left-sided heart failure, cirrhosis, nephrotic syndrome, peritoneal dialysis, or even atelectasis. While an exudative effusion may be due to bacterial pneumonia, viral infections, pulmonary embolism, tuberculosis, and malignancy. A physical exam of a patient with a pearl effusion will reveal dullness for cushion, decreased breast zones on the side of the effusion, decreased tactile firmitus. So to distinguish between a transudative versus exudative fluid, this requires measuring the pleural fluid levels as well as the serum fluid levels of substances like LDH and protein. So like I mentioned before, light criteria is used to differentiate between transudative and exudative effusions. So if you notice a patient has a protein plural over their protein serum is greater than 0.5 and that their LH plural over their LH serum is greater than 0.6 and their LH is greater than two thirds of the upper limit of normal of serum LDH, then you want to think about an exudative transfusion. Well, rather a exudative effusion. What is the next step in management for a child with suspected anaphylaxis? Intramuscular epinephrine. So recall that epinephrine has effects on both the alpha and beta receptors. So the beta-2 agonism will cause bronchodilation, while the alpha-1 agonist will cause vasoconstriction, which leads to increased blood pressure, and decreased airway edema. This is definitely one way that examiners like to test you on these receptors. What is the next step in management for a newborn with respiratory distress and hypoxia secondary to a suspected congenital diaphragmatic hernia? Endotracheal intubation. So it's very important that if a, if a newborn with respiratory distress has congenital diaphragmatic hernia, that you do an endotracheal intubation and you make sure that you do not use a bag mass ventilation because more bowel gas can exacerbate the pulmonary function. 
A gastric tube should be placed immediately after to decompress the stomach and bowel against the lungs. Neonatal respiratory distress syndrome. So this is respiratory distress due to inadequate surfactant levels. On chest x-ray, you can see diffuse granularity of the lung with a ground glass appearance. Gestational diabetes is a risk factor for neonatal respiratory distress syndrome because increased insulin prevents surfactant synthesis and lung maturation by interfering with cortisol. So think, high insulin can cause decreased surfactant, which will lead to NRDS. So treatment for these patients include early positive pressure ventilation, and the risk of NRDS may be reduced by administering maternal antenatal glucocorticoids. This stimulates fetal surfactant synthesis and secretion. So now a bonus question. Which pneumocyte creates surfactant? Is it type 1 or type 2 pneumocytes? Leave it in the comment section below. What is the recommended treatment for a child with a small paraneumonic effusion identified on x-ray with no respiratory distress? Oral antibiotics and outpatient follow-up. Another high yield point is that in patients with subcutaneous emphysema, secondary to severe cough, a chest x-ray must be obtained to rule out a pneumothorax. What is the next step in management for a patient that needs emergency fluid resuscitation and peripheral IV access cannot be obtained? Attempt intraosseous access. It requires less skill and practice than central line placement and is safer and faster. Now let's review some high yield hematology concepts or topics. What is the likely diagnosis in a child with a history of sickle cell disease that presents with hypovolemic shock in the setting of left upper quadrant tenderness and an enlarged spleen? Splenic sequestration. So hypovolemic shock occurs due to the pooling of red blood cells within the spleen. So let's just remember these facts. If a patient has sickle cell disease, hypovolemic shock, left upper quadrant tenderness, and an enlarged spleen, think about splenic sequestration. Hydroxyurea is useful in the treatment of sickle cell anemia because it increases the levels of hemoglobin F to more than 15%. Increased hemoglobin F dilutes the amount of hemoglobin S, thus decreasing pain crises, the need for transfusions, and episodes of acute chest syndrome. What is the most common cause of pediatric stroke? Sickle cell disease. So I can't stress enough how high yield this slide is. So take a moment and commit these facts to memory. What is the likely diagnosis in a five-day-old baby that did not receive perinatal care and presents with easy bruising with an elevated prothrombin time? Vitamin K deficient bleeding. So previously known as hemorrhagic disease of the newborn, this deficiency occurs due to a combination of poor placental transfer, absent gut flora, immature liver function, and inadequate levels of vitamin K in breast milk. What is the likely diagnosis in a child that presents with scattered petechiae, with isolated thrombocytopenia, and enlarged platelets following a viral infection? Immune thrombocytopenia. This is very high yield. So if a patient, let's say that they had a upper stir tract infection and then they present with uh, petechiae and you do blood work and the only thing that's abnormal is that they have thrombocytopenia. 
Think about ITP. It most commonly occurs in children between the ages of 2 to 5 following a viral infection. In children with ITP, skin manifestations only require observation regardless of platelet count, as ITP is generally self-limiting. The treatment for ITP includes IVIG or corticosteroids. What is the likely diagnosis in a child that presents with short stature, hypoplastic thumbs, abnormal skin pigmentation, and aplastic macrocytic anemia? Fanconi's anemia. So this is due to a defect in a non-homologous end joining or double-stranded break repair. Aplastic anemia may be caused by Fanconi's anemia which occurs due to a DNA repair defect resulting in bone marrow failure. What is the likely diagnosis in an adolescent with a history of hemophilia A that presents with a gradual worsening pain and limited motion of his knee? Hemophilic arthropathy. So with this recurrent bleeding, they can have hemosiderin or iron deposition leading to synovitis and fibrosis within the joint. The risk is significantly reduced with prophylactic factor concentrates.